Hi, welcome to Board Gems. This is my weekly video series in which I cover an older board game gem. Usually one that's not rated too, too high. Now, last week I did On the Underground, which was okay because the old version wasn't rated that highly on Board Game Geek, but the new edition certainly is. And I'm cheating again this week because this game this week is actually quite highly rated. I think it's about 7.3 on Board Game Geek, which is pretty good. The reason I'm covering it, though, is because there's a Kickstarter for a new edition, so I wanted to talk about it. The game is Tinner's Trail. It's designed by Martin Wallace and was originally published by his own company, Tree Frog, back, I think, in 2008. It's for three or four players, although the new edition is, I think, one to five, so it has a solo mode as well. It takes 60 minutes or 75 minutes, something like that, and probably you want to stick with ages uh, 12 and up. Now, already, by the time uh, Tinner's Trail came out, Martin Wallace already had a bit of a reputation, a good reputation, and a number of fans. And he had published a number of games uh, through his own company, Warfrog Games, as well as uh, published by other companies. And he had an idea to make a line of games, and it would be a subscription-based service. He'd produce something like 1,500 copies, something like that, signed and numbered, and so you would have to basically order direct from him or possibly through retailers, you know, retailers that might import them. But but they would have to buy directly from him, so not go through distributors. And they would have a unique design aesthetic. So it would be basically just a board and wooden pieces. And that's it. Uh, no cardboard tiles, no cards. It, it kind of started, so this idea actually started more or less with a game called Mordred. Um, he had a, previously published it uh, in just a really simple edition that he would sell himself. And then he kind of published a nice edition, which this is, for charity. Um, it's a British charity for uh, trans, organ transplant recipients and to get them uh, going in, in sports and that. So uh, that was done for that uh, charity. And so this was limited edition, you know, you can't really easily find this, although there's a new edition which borrows heavily from this. Anyway, this has that design aesthetic. It's just a board and uh, some tiddlywinks for money, and then some, uh, just everything else is just wood. No cards, no cardboard. And so with this design aesthetic, he decided to make a range of games, a series of games that shared that aesthetic. And so he rebranded Warfrog games as Tree Frog to represent the, all the wood that would be in his games. And the first game that came out from Tree Frog was Tinner's Trail. So that came out around 2007, 2008. And then a year or so later, we have JKLM publishing this edition of Tinner's Trail. Just like, yeah, just like a year or two later, I think. And uh, this one is a bit more bright and colorful. The original one is very, a little bit uh, drab and spreadsheet-like. Um, this one's a bit more colorful. And you have the new edition coming out from Alley Cat Games, which is on Kickstarter at the time this is recording, and which is even more kind of bright and colorful. Um, so why don't we talk about Tinner's Trail this week? I'll show you how it plays with this JKLM edition, and then we'll talk about why it's a gem. To set up the game, place the board on the table between the players. Give each player all the pieces of a single color. You have three different types of pieces. You have mines, I think you have about six of those. You'll have investment cubes, that's these little cubes here, and you'll have these discs, one of which will go on space 15 of the money track. The money track goes around the board. Investment cubes are used on this table. Each of these spaces can hold two cubes. They can be from the same player or two different players. And for each investment cube on a space, that player will get that many points. And this is how to win. You want to get cubes on here and get points. We need to, this is a map of Cornwall, and we're going to seed all these spaces that show uh, white and orange cubes. And we're going to add cubes on the board. To do that, for each region, you're going to roll the orange, white, and blue dice, add that many cubes of the matching color, 
on that space, and in addition, whatever cubes are pre-printed on the board. These spaces with the pickaxe symbol stay empty for now. Players don't know how much metal are, are in those uh, regions, but we can find that out later over the course of the game through prospecting. But these are the regions that have been prospected and we know exactly what's in them. The orange cubes represent copper, and the price of copper will be marked by an orange cube on this track here, ranging from two to 10 pounds. The white cubes, are tin. And same thing, we'll be marking the price of tin on this track. It'll range from four to seven pounds. Blue is not metal at all. Blue is water. And the number of water cubes in a region tells you how expensive it is to pull out a single cube in that region. If you have a mine in this region, then right now, in order to pull out one copper or one tin would cost four pounds because there's four cubes of water. Whereas a mine in this area, each cube would only cost two. So for players to set up, each player is going to take one of their three discs and place it on space 15 of the money track. That'll represent how much money they have. You're going to take each one disc from each player. You're going to mix them up and that's going to determine the player order for the first round. The third disc you, you don't need right now. The game takes place over four rounds. During a round players are going to be auctioning these regions, building mines in the regions they occupy, and building developments in those regions to either increase their mining capacity, how much metal they're able to mine in a round, or perhaps making it cheaper to, uh, to mine by removing water cubes. And at the end of the round, after all players have finished their actions, they're going to use up their time on the time track here, players must sell all their metal, all the copper and all the tin that they've collected in the round at whatever the current price is for copper and tin. And then, at the end of the round, players will have an opportunity to buy what are called external investments, or foreign investments, I suppose. In the first round, players will be buying victory points. And these are the costs here, and these are the round markers. So in the first round, at the end of the first round, players a player can spend 30 pounds to put a cube here so at the end of the game, they'll get 36 points. But as you'll see in rounds two and three and four, the number of points you get lessens. So investments earlier in the game will pay off more in the long run. But you don't want to spend all your money on investments because you'll need money during the round as well, during the next round, in order to buy more regions on the board, for example. So the first thing that happens every round is we determine the price of copper and tin. And to do that, you're going to roll the three dice twice. First for tin, first for copper. So we'll do it for tin. You add them up, that's 10, and in the first round you're going to add plus one. So that total will be 11, and you look up the total, and here's 11. You'll place it here. Tin is worth a lot, seven pounds. Then you're going to roll the dice again for copper. And again, add plus one, seven, plus one is eight. That's going to be here, eight pounds. Keep in mind at the start of a round, if a marker is in the farthest rightmost column, then whatever you roll, you're gonna subtract one from it. It's just kind of a pull on uh, demand. And likewise, if a uh, marker is on the far left column here at the start of a round, then whatever you roll, you're going to add one to it. After you determine the prices of copper and tin, you're going to add developments to this area. And what you add depends on the round number. So in round one, you're, we're going to add this. So in this case, it'll be two boats. 
two ports, I should say. I'm gonna add two ports, one added, and two minors. In later rounds, we may see some trains. And also you're going to add these steam discs. And you're going to fill up this bottom row up to the current round number. So in round one, you're going to add one disc, like so. But in round three, you would add one disc there, and two discs there, and two more discs here. Like so, you're gonna fill up to the round number. And now is the main part of the round in which players perform their actions. Each player has up to 10 time units to spend. Each action takes a certain amount of time, and as they spend time, they're going to move their marker along this track. If they reach 10, they can't do anything more and they must pass. So starting with the player in first place here in, uh, in the number one slot, players are going to perform actions, and based on the action, they're going to move their marker forward a number of spaces on this track. So what are some of the actions that you can do? One thing you can do is build a mine. The player whose turn it is takes this black pawn and picks any region on the board that is not yet owned, that doesn't already have a mine in it. And they'll choose that to auction off. You can even auction off these empty ones. And then when a player wins the auction and gets that, then they get to prospect it and see what kind of metal is in there. But that's a bit of a mystery. You could auction off one that already has cubes in it. And then the player whose turn it is, the one who put it up for auction, must start the bidding and must bid at least one pound. And players are going to go clockwise around there, upping the bid. All the players are involved in the auction, except players who already have all six mines on the board and players who don't have enough time, because building a mine takes two time units. So a player who is at nine or ten would not be able to take part in the auction because they don't have two uh, time units to spend on building the mine. So players like that will have to sit out the auction. But otherwise, it goes around. Each player has to drop out or increase the bid. Once you drop out, you can't come back in. And then, after all the players have dropped out except one, that player will pay their bid, moving, let's say it was green, moving their marker down however many that they chose to spend and they would put their mine in that space. And now that region is owned by that player. And that player would go up two spaces on the time track. Note that if another player won the auction, let's say Purple won the auction, Purple would move ahead too. Whoever is furthest behind, whoever has used the least amount of time, is always the player who goes next. So right now, we say that's green. Once Purple builds a mine, if they win the auction, for example, well, it's still Green's turn. Green is still the person who's used the least amount of time, and Green will get to go again. And they could do another action. They could put another region up for auction, or do any one of, the, of a number of other actions. Let's say Green won that bid. They would move forward to like that. Then it's Purple's turn. If purple were to also win an, um, a region in an auction, then they would move their marker too. And the way the time track works is that if you land on the same column as another player, you move your marker just underneath, like so. Just to remember the order that the players got to, so green will go, in this case, before purple. Another action you can do you can only do this, of course, if you have a mine, is mine. You actually pull some metals out. You pick one of your mines, and you pull out uh, up to a number of metal cubes, the white or the orange ones, up to the region's current mining capacity. Now, by default, a mine has a capacity of two, which means you can pull two metal cubes at most out of a region in one action. That action would cost one time but you can increase the mining capacity via some of the developments, which we'll talk about later. Now, whenever you mine, you always add a water cube. So let's say it was Purple's turn and Purple decides to mine 
and they see the price of tin is quite high, so they're going to mine two tin. That's two cubes. Each cube that you pull out costs one pound per water cube that's in that region. So each of these tin cubes would cost four pounds. And purple would then be spending eight in order to pull these two tin cubes. And purple would get this and put it in front of them. And then after mining, always add a water cube. The water is starting to fill up the mine shafts. Another thing you can do is build a development. And there's a few different developments. There's five different developments. Trains are not appearing in this round yet. <laughs> and each development does different things. A port can be built in a region that is adjacent to water. It doesn't have to have a mine in it. You could even do this one if you wanted to. To build a port costs two time and increases the mining capacity of that region by one. So now if you have a mine and a port, you can pull three cubes at once. This is an adit. It's a shaft that helps uh, channel some of the water out of the mine shaft. And building an adit can actually result in finding more uh, metal, more veins that you can uh, that you can mine. When you build an adit, it takes three time points. So you move three spaces on this time track, and you would place the adit between two regions, like so. The benefit of the adit benefits both regions that it spans whose border it spans. It doesn't increase your mining capacity, but for each region, it adds one tin cube, one copper cube, and removes one water cube. The miner, when added to a region, increases its mining capacity by one, only costs one time, uh, time point. The train, if you build a train, costs two time points. You place it in a region, it increases the mining capacity of that region by one, removes two water cubes from its region, and one water cube from every adjacent region. And finally, there's the steam disks. This, when you choose the steam disks, you choose a pile. So in the first round, there's only one pile of one disk. But in round three, for example, there's going to be three piles, and these two are going to have two disks, and this one just one. As an action, and it costs one time point to pick a pile, and for each disc in that pile, you get to remove one water cube from anywhere on the board. If you So if you pulled up a stack of two steam discs, you get to remove two water cubes. You don't get to keep them. You don't have to use them all, but if you don't, they just go away. You never keep them. You just pick them up, put them to the side, and immediately spend them to remove water cubes. And those are some of the developments that you'll see during the game. Of course, you can't build a development if you don't have the time. But time is really the only cost. You don't have to spend money on these developments, just time. So another action that players can do is if they want to stall, or if they're just short a buck or two, they can sell pasties. The Cornish pasty is a, is a pastry that miners eat. And you can just spend one time point to gain one pound. And it's also a stalling tactic if you want to stall for some reason. So let's say red did something that took three, t let's say red chose the, the add it, put it somewhere, and it looks something like this. Then the next player to go would be yellow, because yellow is furthest back on the time track. So if yellow decides to do an action that costs two, for example, yellow's marker would then be here, and then it would be green's turn and then purples, and then reds and then yellows, and so on. At any point, you can drop out. And if you drop out, you move your marker to this track. And the first player to drop out will put theirs in the one spot. Now that does two things. One, that means that that player will be going first, later, but it also means that they get to prospect. The first two players who pass are going to be able to prospect. That means they get to pick an empty region on the board of their choice, and populate it. They roll the dice and see what's in it. So the players who pass first and second get to choose regions uh, to prospect. So after every, if, if you're out of time and there's nothing else to do, then you have to pass. And if everybody has passed 
except for one player, then that player just has one more action, regardless of how much time it takes, and then that player will have to pass. These other players can't just wait for this player to do multiple actions. No, they just get one more action, and then they have to pass. And then that's the new order. So this is the player order for the next round, but it's also the player order for the investment phase, which is coming up, and that's very important. Now, the next thing that happens is all the players sell all the cubes that they've collected over the course of the round, all the tin and copper. You can't hang on to copper and tin for later rounds where it might be worth more. Nope, whatever you collect, you have to sell at whatever the current price is. So in this case, a player who has this much would sell two tin for 14 and two copper for 16 for a total of 30. And they would move their marker up 30 spaces on the money track. After all players have sold all their metal, then it's the investment phase. Players get to spend money on investments. And again, in this order, players are able to take turns buying investments. Players will take their investment markers, these little cubes here, and choose a box in this column, in the column matching the round. So in round one, it would of course be this column. Player just, the player chooses how much money they want to spend, and they place a cube in that space, paying that money, moving that marker down the money track. And at the end of the game, they will get this many points. Each box can have at most two cubes of any colors. So purple could have both spots, possibly. But it could be any combination. But once a box has two cubes, no more cubes can go into that box. Players will have to go somewhere else. You can pass, unlike the auction, if you pass, you can still come in later. So on your turn, you may buy an investment by spending the money and placing the cube in or pass. And it goes like that clockwise. When it comes back around to your turn, even if you passed, you can take a turn and put in another investment. And this round, this phase of the round, only ends when all players have passed consecutively. Keep in mind, players have a limited number of these cubes. I think it's 12 that have to last the whole game. And of course, you want to put them out early because they'll be worth more points early in the game. The catch is, of course, you'll still want to have a little bit of money left over for auctions, perhaps, uh, in the later rounds. After the investment phase, the players who passed first and second get an opportunity to prospect. The, each player, so starting with the player who passed first, will pick any region that does not yet have any cubes on it. So let's say red picked this one. You could even put the marker in there to mark it. And then that player will roll the dice and add that many cubes. So players can kind of see what's in there before auctioning. And then yellow would choose a different region to prospect. And then you start a new round. You determine the new uh, price of tin and copper. Again, for any marker that's in this column, you'll subtract one from whatever total you roll. And any marker that's in this column, you'll add one to the total and adjust it to the new positions. You're going to fill up this box. If there's any still left in here by the end of the round, just move them to the side and then just repopulate a new. So for the second round, you would add two ships and add it two miners, and two piles of steam disks. This pile having two, this pile having one. And then, again, starting in now this order, players will have an opportunity to do actions and move along the time track. And you're going to do that four times. After four rounds, money left over is just a tiebreaker. At the, in the last round, spend as much money as you can on these final investments. And at the end of the game, total up the point values of every cube you have in this table. And the player with most points wins. Money is a tiebreaker. That's it. You're ready to play Tinner's Trail. Now the first edition of Tinner's Trail from Tree Frog Games is completely serviceable. I haven't actually played it myself, but there's photos. You know, there's the internet. Um, the board is is really drab and could be accused of being kind of spreadsheet-like. 
Um, and it does do something which really pushes my pawns. It really gets me going, like, Ugh! which is the there's there's tables on the board, text, and you know spaces to put wooden pieces, and they point in different directions. <laughs> So one table is pointing this way, the top of the text is that way, and another one is going that way, and it's like, oh, uh, you know, I understand, like, it should work, because, you know, you can look around the board, I guess, but it doesn't, it really doesn't. Um, so that's the thing that just bugs me. So the edition I have is from JKLM, and it's completely fine, it's pretty much exactly the same game, and certainly in terms of rules and that. Uh, and of course the board is a bit more bright and colorful. And then we have the new version from Alley Cat. And at the end of this video, at the end of this Why to Gem section, I'm going to talk a bit about Alley Cat's edition from what I've seen on the Kickstarter. I've read the rules and we'll talk about the differences and what I think of them. One thing you have to say about the those early tree frog games that had just tons and tons of wood is, oh, it had great table presence, right? You know, you have this board and you have tons of wood on it, a bunch of cubes, and the mines are like really large in, in Tinner's Trail, so they really, you know, stand up quite tall. And of course you have the other things like the ports and the trains, and it's just a big variety of wooden pieces. And it just, just just feels like there's a lot of stuff going on. And not in a bad way, because the game is not very complicated. Now I want to assure people that it is a Martin Wallace game. So it is a, a deep game, but unlike some games like brass i suppose but a lot of his other games it's not really all that complicated to learn it's one of the lighter wallace games now i want to stress though that it is a wallace game martin wallace is a type of game designer i really respect um you know some games are accused of being about the mechanisms more than the actual theme and setting and so you could argue, it's like, oh, well, that game could have been placed anywhere. It could have been ancient Egypt. It could have been, you know, the Wild West. And it doesn't matter. It could be the same game. And Martin Wallace definitely starts with the theme and setting first. He finds an interesting topic in history, does some research on it, tries to get kind of a big picture view of it. And then from that, designs a board game. A board game set in a historical setting. And look, I don't know anything about the topic myself other than from playing the game. But I, I agree that the topic is fascinating, and I'm really glad Martin Wallace um, designed a board game around it, and a very good board game. I like it quite a bit. Martin Wallace borrowed mechanisms from two other famous games, and he acknowledges it in the credits. One is the Princes of Florence idea of, at the end of every round, buying victory points with money, but being able to choose how many points to buy while still having enough money for the next round. It's an interesting decision point. Another thing he borrows, and I think Tinner's Trail might have been one of the early games that borrowed this, but a few other games have borrowed it as well, including like Red November and a number of others, is uh, what I think what some designers started to call the Prince Track. Peter Prince was a designer of a game called Jenseits von Taben, or what we know of as Thebes. And he introduced a really fascinating idea of what's called the Time Track, which is a track that tracks when you do action, instead of spending action points, it's like, oh, you have X action points, this is what you do on your turn. It's like, no, every action you do costs a different number of action points, but you track the points as you go, and whoever has used the fewest points up to this point is the next player to go in turn order. And it works really well in Tinner's Trail because it adds kind of an interactivity, it adds a, an, an element to it, because when you are going through, you're, you're playing, you're making turns, you're deciding what to do, right? It's like, oh, it's my turn, what do I do? Well, I can do this thing that spends one action time, one time point. Another thing that spends three time points. I want to do the three time point thing, definitely, but I also want to do the one time point thing, and, and if I don't want to do that too late, I want to do it early. So if I do the three one, then that's going to put me kind of out of commission for a while, and the other player is going to be able to do a bunch of stuff. So maybe I should do that one thing first. Maybe only one person can do the three thing, right? Maybe there's only one at it. And maybe I want the at it, but I don't want to put myself out of the out of actions for, for three time units. So it, it really, uh, I love Thebes. Uh, that's a favorite in our family, and that's a really great element. And it works really well in Tinner's Trail as well. 
there is an element of randomness in the game because the game comes, this edition comes with three dice. And the dice are used in two ways. One way is you roll the dice together to determine the price every round of tin and copper. But moreover, the uh, regions on the board, you roll dice to determine how much tin, how much copper, how much water is in every region. Now, that element of randomness is high, but it it's not one of those things like, oh, a player rolls the dice and, oh, it's a bad roll. Oh, no. It's not like that. You're rolling the dice to determine what's in a region. And unless a player buys a region without knowing what's in it, which is possible in this game, but they're taking that risk, right? Other than that, everybody is operating under the same, like everybody sees the state of the game, right? Everything is out in the open and there's information that, players don't have but nobody has that information so everything is out there and everybody's making decisions based on the state of the game board nothing hidden and i love that i like that because for one thing it's easy to teach too right because there's nothing like like seven wonders great game i find it so difficult to teach that game to new gamers because they're making decisions based on the cards in their hand and i can't see their cards and the cards do quite different things right and it, if people make mistakes, it can really mess up the game. Seven Wonders is kind of unique that way. But any game with hidden information has that kind of potential. So Tinner's Trail, with everything out in the open, does make it kind of easy to teach for the type of game it is. So it's a great bridge game. We used to call it a bridge game. The term never really took off. So you have gateway games, right? Gateway games are, are games... I don't even think gateway game is used much anymore. But a gateway game is something like a Ticket to Ride or a Catan or a Carcassonne, just like a game that, that anybody could play, and it introduces them to a wider variety of games, right? So after they've played those games and enjoy them, you as a hobbyist are thinking, well, I want to get them kind of more involved in, you know, a more strategic games. And so you're looking for a next step, like a next step game or a bridge game, a Tinner's Tale, tr tr Trinner's, tr Trinner's Tale. The Tale of the Trinners. Tinner's Trail is great that way because it is quite strategic. It's all about the player actions. It's all about the decisions. But because everything is open, everybody can see what everybody else is doing. And so if I'm doing my turn, I can talk people through it. Like, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it, right? Another player, come, uh, their turn comes up. They have no idea what to do. I can mention a couple things, right? I can say, oh, well, you know, this is over here, you know, these are some possibilities. And it's not unfair because everybody gets that information at the same time. But it introduces that sort of Martin Wallace style, which is, which is a, quite a strategic and deep game. Now, that randomness, I wanna talk about it because a lot of people, I think, complain about the randomness. It certainly is more random than some of his other games. And it's because of the dice rolls. But again, the randomness, is more to do with seeding the board, right? I mean, the price can vary. Let's say the price of tin and copper are both very high, right? Maybe tin is a little bit higher comparatively. And so players make the decision, say, okay, I'm going to pull out tin on my turn and sell that, and there's only copper left. I'm gonna leave that for next turn. But the next turn, the price of copper tanks, people can get kind of frustrated. But the thing is, and this is, this is a common theme for me. Like, I tell this to everybody who will listen, uh, which is becoming fewer and fewer um, people. You always want a bit of randomness. And Tinner's Trail has a really great balance of randomness. You don't want a completely perfect information game and with very little randomness. What happens in those types of games often is that, yes, the, they're more strategic, they're more thinky. It's like, okay, that's interesting. And then one player wins, and there's no doubt that player won due to a superior strategy, or they're smarter, or something. And it leaves everybody else feeling, uh, I'm dumb. <laughs> and a game is too random, even if you win, you don't feel satisfied, right? It's like, well, I just won because of dumb luck. The perfect balance between randomness and strategy has the effect that the winner of the game feels they won due to superior strategy that they made better decisions during the game. Whereas the losers 
they can blame the luck. Oh, I would have won if not for this dice roll or something, right? And that's, that's the perfect balance where the winner feels smart and the losers don't feel dumb. And Tinner's Trail threads that needle perfectly. And it's important to note that the randomness is thematic. I mean, Martin Wallace is not a dumb designer and he's made lots of strategic board games. He could have come up with a different system to determine how much tin and copper was and water was in a particular region, what the prices of tin and copper were from round to round. But, and he points this out in his designer notes, that's thematic. The prices of tin and copper varied wildly at that time. Because, you know, a new load would be discovered and suddenly the prices go down, but then that load is, is uh, used up and then the prices go back up, right? And it's not under the player's control. The game is limited, the original game, is limited to only three or four players, which is a very narrow player range. Um, I mean, the game is the same for three and four, probably a bit better with four, uh, because there's the investment phase, and there are limitations on how many investments can be in a particular uh, amount, basically, a particular box on the table. And with a three-player game, you don't really have to worry about being blocked. But in a four-player game, there's a little bit of blocking. That, that's really where the only situation where it comes in. But otherwise, three players is fine. Uh, four players is probably a bit better. Uh, there's lots of discussion on Board Game Geek. How do we play this with two? And you know what? It's an auction game. Auction games are not just not going to be satisfying with two. There's lots of variants. Lots of people have tried to come up with their own variants on, on how to play it with two because two is... You have a great game and you love it, but you only have two people. Find a way to play it, right? I, I understand it. Um, play something else, as far as I'm concerned. None of those variants... I read a bunch of them. None of them seem particularly like oh they nailed it like that's the way to play like i would just probably just avoid it with two now of course keep in mind the new edition does play two players let's talk about that new edition so the new edition is on kickstarter right now at the time of recording and it's for one to five players uh, so there's a developer who made a lot of effort, put in a lot of effort to come up with a two-player system, and from the two-player system also developed the solo mode, which is against, I guess, a dummy player. Um, expanded it to five players, which would be pretty intense, I feel. Um, now, there are a lot of changes. So one thing is that, as I mentioned, Tinner's Trail, it's, it's a board and a bunch of wood, and that's it. It was, it was original tree frog aesthetic is no cards, no cardboard. And, well, there's both in this new edition. The cardboard comes in, in that instead of seeding each region by rolling the dice and adding that many cubes, and honestly, at the beginning of the game, setup is a little bit annoying because there's like eight or so regions and you roll the dice and add the cubes to every one. So setup's a little bit annoying in the original. Instead, they use cardboard tiles, which have printed on them on one side how much tin, how much copper, how much water. So I think this is actually a really good idea. It does two things. One is it makes setup a little bit, I guess technically a little bit easier, but it also makes it a little more balanced, right? Uh, Tinner's Trail, the game can vary widely. This can be good or bad, because if all the rolls, the dice rolls are really high or really low, like over the course of the same game, then the games can vary quite differently, right? People are really struggling to get money or, or they're swimming in money, right? Um, and so the cardboard tiles kind of even out that, that randomness a bit. And the other thing is it really adds an element to the prospecting. So at the end of the phase, the players who passed first and second, right? They have the uh, option of picking regions to prospect, to find out what's in them. And so what do you do? You roll the dice and put those cubes on the board, and now that information is available to everyone. But in the new edition, they're face-down tiles, so the players who prospect can just peek at the tile and put it back down. You can put a little peek token on it to say, like, hey, I looked at this, so later on, don't worry, I'm allowed to look at it again, right? And so they have private information that other people don't. So that's a really clever aspect. I, I like that quite a bit. Now, it also introduces cards in this new edition. 
So you have the dual use cards. You have you have players can have a hand of cards, and they can play cards on the auction to affect the auction. But also they can play cards on a region once they win it to kind of buff up the the stats of that region. I suppose. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I mean, some players are gonna like it. It's more, I guess, more surprising, more interactive. I guess. Um, already I felt the auctions were pretty interactive anyway. Um, and it adds an element of hidden information, which again, some people are going to like, some people aren't. To me, it seems like a weird and wonky thing. Um, I don't know how it would work if you could just play without them. It looks like it might be possible. You could just forget about the cards and play the original way. That's probably what I would do. But obviously I haven't tested it. The investment phase is quite different now. So in the investment phase... Previously, you would be able to choose how much money to spend and then get investments. And the investments would pay off more in the early rounds versus the later rounds. But oddly, to some people, the more you spend doesn't result in a higher return, right? If I spend 20 pounds and somebody else spends 10, that player is going to get half as many victory points as I am. Whereas it feels like I should get a little bit more because I committed more. I don't think it's a huge deal. It's a design decision and it works fine as it is. Uh, they totally changed it up in this game. So now it's based on player order. You can choose how much money to spend completely in increments of five pounds. And every increment of 10, sometimes there's a little bit of, a, of an in improvement as well. But the players who pass earlier in the round have a better rate, a better exchange rate of money to VP. Um, I like that as well. Um, I'm tempted to almost print out that investment table and, and include it in my copy of Tinner's Trail, and maybe I'll try that next time I play. Uh, it's a neat idea. I like that too. And of course, you get the scaling of the board for different player counts. That's pretty, pretty great and necessary, especially because now it's a much wider player range. Uh, the new edition does come with two expansions. Uh, notably, the expansions were not done by the game designer the original designer, Martin Wallace, they were done by the developer. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I haven't played the expansions. Um, I think that's, an, that's interesting that the developer or uh, working with Alley Cat Games, like, oh, we'll, we'll come up with our own expansions. Um, that does make my reaction to them just a tiny bit more tepid. I mean, maybe the developer is a great designer. I'm not familiar with his work, but you know, usually I like to, I like to see the things coming from the original designer when possible. Um, but I'm going to be honest anyway, I'm not much of an expansion guy, mostly because I play so many different types of games that I usually don't have much of an interest in taking a game whose base game I already like and just throwing in more expansions. It's different for games like Dominion or Flashpoint where you want to add like, you know, you want to expand the game, but it doesn't necessarily add a whole lot in terms of complexity. A lot of expansions, they just add complexity. And to me, that doesn't add fun. That's just me, though. You know, um, if you want to make Tinner's Trail a more complicated game, have at it. Of course, lots of other complicated games that you could play instead of Tinner's Trail. I happen to really like the comparative simplicity of Tinner's Trail compared to some of other Martin Wallace's games. This is, might be my favorite Martin Wallace game. I love the look of it. Uh, it has a really great table presence. It's a thinky game, but there's an element of randomness so you have to be constantly changing your plans. Your plans are going to be changing every round based on how the prices change and some new development comes up. Oh, I had my money I was planning to mine, but maybe I should try to get that new mine and join in that auction. I kind of have mixed feelings about the new edition. Um, some things I like, I think the cardboard tiles are kind of neat. I don't feel like I'm going to enjoy the card play. Um, and the expansions I'm not interested in, but the investment phase is cool. So it, for me, it's a mixed bag. Um, but for other people, uh, you know, if you find an original version of Tinner's Trail, either Tree Frog or JKLM, it's great too. You can just stick with that unless you hate randomness. But if you hate randomness, you don't have to play Tinner's Trail. You can play something else, you know what I mean? But, you know, if there might be stretch goals or something, so uh, certainly the new edition looks pretty good. So really, you can't go wrong with any edition of Tinner's Trail. It's a great game. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Tinner's Trail don't stop being good just because new games come out.
Take care.